So welcome back to the uh, Peter Carr Memorial Conference. Our next speaker uh, requires no introduction, Jim Gatherall. Uh, he's uh, going to talk to us about Peter Carr and the variance contract. Jim. All right, thank you. Thank you, Christos. And thank you to the organizer for organizing this wonderful memorial conference. Uh, I guess I should start with a few words about Peter Carr and how I knew him. Um, Peter Carr was always there for like 30 years at whatever conference I happened to be speaking at, he was there. I think when I first presented rough volatility or one of the first times was a seminar at Columbia. There were three people in attendance and he was one of them. So he was just everywhere. But it's only recently that I began to appreciate not just his uh, encyclopedic knowledge of the finance literature, but the breadth uh, and depth of his collaborations and interests. Now, I'm going to talk about one small corner of his work, and I hope to give you a sense of maybe, maybe his taste and how it inter intersected maybe with mine. Um, I think you'll see some things. Uh, I showed somebody the slides He said, oh, really, you can do that? But it was all in his paper already, so you will see. Okay, so now, mm -hmm. does this really work? It seems not. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. We're 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 good. So here's what I'm going to talk about. We're going to start off with the Karmadan spanning formula. You've seen this many times, but no harm in repeating it. I'm going to treat this almost like a Baruch lecture. In other words, it will be at a pretty elementary level. And the main tools will be, as I like to say to my students, Ito's lemma and integration by parts. So, sorry? <laughs> I, sorry, can, I, I can't, I'm sorry, I really can't hear. Oh, will there be a test afterwards, over lunch? <laughs> uh, so then we will use the, the spanning formula to derive expressions, model-free expressions for the variance in the gamma contract. And then we'll show, we'll apply this to the construction of the VIX. And then we kind of switch topics, another Peter Carr topic, optimal trading under log utility. And then we'll go on to uh, study how this works in practice. I'll talk a little bit about the, the variance premium. So that's, that's a plan of the talk. So here's the first paper that we're going to look at. Notice that I have the original paper, not the working paper that people all download. I actually bought the book in the old days uh, towards a theory of volatility trading. And this paper is uh, famous for a number of things, but in particular, it's famous for the spanning, spanning formula. So let's assume that European options with all possible strikes and expirations are traded. Uh, Obviously, that sounds like a stylized assumption, but it's really true. In other words, you could go to Morgan Stanley and ask for any strike, any expiration from like one day out to 10 years, and they will give you a price. The Karmadan spanning formula shows that any twice differentiable payoff at time t may be statically hedged using a portfolio of European options expiring at time t. And in fact, if you're a physicist and you allow yourself to use delta functions and not just twice differentiable, you can extend this to anything. So here's the result. It says that some uh, payoff G, which I say stand for giraffe or something, some complicated thing, can be decomposed into a bunch of standard put and call payoffs. So this is a put payoff and this is a call payoff. And what are the weights? The weights are just the second derivative of G. Okay, so how does the proof go? Well, you decompose G into its components using the delta function, just integrate, integral of 
the function with respect to the delta function. And then you split this thing into two and then integrate by parts. Okay, integrate by parts once you get this term from here and you get that term from there. And then we integrate by parts again. And then it, the result pops out because we see that here we have something that's just f minus t, f minus s rather. And so we get a model free, model free at least for, uh, we get a model free decomposition of the payoff. So it shows how to decompose any payoff giraffe into hockey stick payoffs. In particular, any such payoff can be hedged with a static position in European vanilla options and forward contracts. So this is your position in the forward contract, and this is your position in standard European options. Now, what's the fair value of this payoff? Well, the fair value is given by expectation under the pricing measure. So we get, and obviously F is equal to expectation of the stock price. I'm assuming, well, I'm not really assuming, but I'm assuming uh, throughout zero rates and dividends because they just complicate things for no reason. And then we get from that formula that the expectation of the payoff is just uh, G computed at the expectation of S plus this thing where these represent undiscounted put and call prices. The fair value of G is thus expressed in terms of, and in general, infinite strip of puts and calls. And of course, you can stick as you could stick a standard call in here, and then you would find it's either a put or a call, depending on whether it's on or out of the money, and you would get that this thing works out. So from those equations, we see that any European style payoff may be replicated using a portfolio of European options with strikes in general from zero to infinity. The weight of each option is equal to the second derivative of the payoff at the strike. Portfolio of European options is a static hedge because the weight of an option with a particular strike depends only on the strike price and the form of the payoff. Let me go here so I can point towards you. And the form of the payoff and not on time or the level of the stock price. It's and the decomposition is completely model independent. Now consider a contract whose payoff is the log. And of course, you've seen this story many times, uh, but let's tell the story again. Then the second derivative of that payoff, the log is one over S squared, minus one over S squared. So then we get that the expectation of the log contract is just a strip of puts and calls with weights minus one over K squared. So rewriting that in terms of the log strike variable, which I think looks more elegant, or at least it looks more suggest suggestive because people get kind of worried when they see weights of one over K squared and they say, well, what happens when K goes to zero? Well, when we write it this way, we see there's no problem. Whenever things are written in terms of the log strike, everything looks ni nice and symmetric. And we see it's basically a, a, an integral of Q where Q is the price of an out of the money option. So these are out of the money options expressed in terms of percentage of the strike price. So again, assuming zero rates and dividends, um, then um, expectation of ST is just S naught and so on and so forth. Now, with that assumption, let's compute path by path. What is log? ST over F, which is the payoff of the log contract. Well, log ST over S, I like to call this the fundamental theorem of integral calculus, namely the integral is the sum of the bits. So integral from naught to T of the changes in the log spot. Well, what is that? That's just Ito's lemma. That gives me DS over S minus VT over two. Well, the second term, 
This is obviously minus a half the quadratic variation. You see it's a random variable. And what is this? Well, this is a hedging strategy. What is the hedging strategy? Well, you can see from the PNL of these step is just one over S times DS. So this is the hedging strategy that says, always hold a dollar in stock. So if the stock price goes down or the stock price goes up, buy or sell so that you're always holding $1. So obviously this is a model independent hedging strategy. So the second term, as I said before, is immediately recognizable as half of the quadratic variation. And the first term represents the payoff of a strategy which involves maintaining a constant dollar amount in stock. Now, since the log payoff on the left-hand side can be hedged using a portfolio of European options, we exhibited what it is. It follows that quadratic variation may be replicated in a completely model independent way, so long as the stock price process is a diffusion. In particular, volatility may be stochastic or deterministic, and that equation still applies. So basically, uh, we have completely model independent result here. I think it's the most, it's for me, it's the most beautiful thing. Now, taking the risk neutral expectation of that last expression, uh, we get that the expectation of quadratic variation is given by twice the strip of out of the money options. It's given by the value of an infinite strip of European options in a completely model independent way, so long as the underlying process is diffusion. Well, you probably know already that I hate jumps. I mean, Peter Carr, he kind of liked jumps. Well, it's unclear whether he liked them or he was willing to accommodate them. But anyway, he liked using jumps. I hate jumps. So I'm willing to accept that this diffusion assumption is a good one. Now, what's the main application of this or one important application of this? In 2004, the CBOE listed futures on the VIX, which is, as you know, is an implied volatility index, commonly known as the fear index. You'll see in a minute why. Originally, the VIX computation was designed to mimic the implied volatility of an at-the-money one-month one option on the OEX index. It did this in a kind of complicated way. And then the, CBO, the CBOE changed the VIX computation. They said CBOE is changing VIX to provide a more precise and robust measure of expected market volatility and to create a viable underlying index for tradable volatility products. Now, what did that mean? Well, obviously what it meant was they're using that formula with Q in it. Um, now, I don't know whether Peter Carr was advising CBOE. I wouldn't be surprised if he was consulting for them, but I don't know the history of this. Maybe somebody can tell me over coffee whether he was a consultant to them. Anyway, here's the revised VIX definition from the white paper. And you can see it's just a straight discretization of the formula that I projected up before with big Q instead of little Q. But that's because it's in terms of strike rather than log strike. So it's a straightforward discretization of the variance log strip. And here's a graph of the history of the VIX. And you can see why people call it the fear index. It spikes up when something bad happens. So what, what well, let's, let's do a test online. Sebastian, what happened here? Two thousand and eight. Two thousand and eight. Oh, you're thinking of oh, 08. Yeah, this one. Oh, 08. Yeah, I, I forgive you. The letters are small. And what about this one? So you can recover. What about this one here? So, so, so we have a postponement. Yeah, COVID. Excellent. So we see these huge spikes. Whenever something nasty happens in the market, we see these huge spikes in the VIX. And interestingly, since 2013, more Vega is traded in VIX and VIX options 
than is traded in the S&P, which is itself the most liquid, uh, the biggest option market in the world, I believe. So um, basically, VIX is the place where people hedge volatility risk. Here's a graph showing the growth and activity in the VIX market. Uh, you know, so that uh, Peter Carr paper was written in 2004, I think. So this is zero, and then warm, huge activity in both in terms of open interest and volume on uh, VIX futures. Now, let's do something interesting, which I know was a favorite of Peter Carr's. When Peter Carr, uh, maybe 20 years ago, when, yeah, I guess 15, 20 years ago when he was talking about this, he always used to love talking about corridor variance. Well, consider a contract whose payoff is this one. So G for corridor, and it looks complicated, but forget these things. These things are just extrapolations. What it is, is basically just the log contract, uh, but only where chopped up so that S lies in the interval between K minus, the low strike, and K plus, the high strike. So it's just a log contract in the inner, inner interval, linearly extrapolated. Then uh, GC and GC prime are continuous, and G double prime is exactly the same thing that we had before, except it's restricted to the interval. Here's a picture of GC and comparing it with G, assuming G is just the log contract, and you can see they're very, very similar payoffs. How do you hedge it? You hedge it exactly the same way. I mean, you can go through the math, which I'm not going to do, but uh, you hedge it exactly the same way. Whenever S is between K minus and K plus, you just keep rehedging so that you maintain $1 in the stock. When it goes below K minus or above K plus, you basically stop doing anything. And you have this log strip that corresponds to uh, that payoff. So what is the log strip? Well, the log strip is precisely the same log strip, except it only has options between K minus and K plus. So it's the same story as before, except we've restricted everything to this interval. What does that contract pay? It pays inst instantaneous variance, so long as the spot is between K minus and K plus. If the spot goes between below K minus, it doesn't pay anything. If the spot goes above K plus, it doesn't pay anything. Now that we know how to make a corridor variance swap, let's start trading. Let's do a forward starting corridor variance swap. Well, how do we do that? We, in other words, let's have a contract that play, pays instantaneous variance, conditional on the stock price between being between K minus and K plus, and conditional on the time between being, bet, being between T minus and T plus. Well, this is just a spread, obviously. And what do we get? We get that this is twice the calendar spread, we out of the money options out to T plus, and out of the money options out to T minus. In this way, we can trade instantaneous variance conditional on S being in this interval and T being in that interval. I call this a localized variance contract. You can see where I'm going with this. It sounds like De Pere's local variance, but it's not quite. It's localized. It's integrated in both dimensions. An immediate practical corollary to this is the local variance surfaces should be as smooth as possible. Why? Well, because you can trade these things. In other words, if you have a crazy local variance surface with huge peaks and large troughs, you just need to pick a place where the peak is very high and sell this localized variance contract and then buy the trough. Now, somebody's going to say, well, that's ridiculous. The bid offers in practice are too huge. It's what you're saying is completely impractical. Well, well, it's not so impractical if, for example, you're, at a you're a trader at a firm 
uh, with a crazy local volatility surface like that, because you can easily choose to buy and sell contracts that will make you a lot of money today. Uh, so basically you can, so the net, the, the bottom line is local variance surfaces have to be smooth. They cannot be incredibly jumpy. Now, recall that Dupier's local variance is given by this formula here. And in fact, this, this sounds like a repeat of what he told us earlier on in his talk. And it is kind of a repeat of what he told us earlier in his talk, but from a different perspective, maybe a little bit. So let T plus and T minus go to T. In other words, very close. So we do a very tiny localized variance swap and let K plus and minus go to K. Then what do we get? Well, we, that means that S can be approximated as K, right? And this, it, we can approximate V sub T as V sub capital T. So we, we get this line. And then we take the fact that local variance is the uh, conditional expectation of V sub capital T. So we get this. And what is this thing here? This is just the uh, probability density over that tiny interval. So we get this. This is the left-hand side of the equation gives us just local variance times the probability density dk dt. Also on the right-hand side of this equation, right-hand side of this equation, right-hand side of this equation, what is this thing? Well, obviously it's just dq by dt times dt, roughly speaking. So we get this. So now equating the left-hand side and the right-hand side, what do we get? We get V local of K and T is this, the Dupier formula. Now I showed this to somebody the other day. He said, wow, amazing. But it's all in the original paper. If you care to take a look, it's all there, carefully explained. So now we have the Dupier formula and you can see everything is tradable using localized variance swaps. Now, you can generalize this whole thing. In fact, Fukasawa generalized it in a paper that he wrote in 2014. <clears throat> he gives the static hedge, quasi-static hedge for a weighted variance contract. And the, way the static hedge is given in terms of the uh, this double integral or say, yeah, double integral of the weight. So the left-hand side of this equation is the payoff to be hedged. And the right-hand side, uh, so the, the, this is like the usual thing, and that's the hedging strategy. This is the model-free hedging strategy. So the first term on the right-hand side corresponds to a static position in options, this thing. So it's the same story as before, and you can apply this to the gamma contract, uh, what's the payoff of a gamma contract? The payoff of a gamma contract is basically, instead of having just variance, you have variance multiplied by the stock price. And there are all sorts of reasons for doing this. Uh, it turns out to be uh, useful for hedging dispersion trades. Um, and according to Roger Lee, actually, I forgot to say, I'm going to be referring to papers by Karen Madan, Obviously, Delete is his probably favorite co-author. Uh, Peter Carl Yuren Wu, another favorite co-author. The one co-author that I'm missing today is Roger Lee. And uh, because I didn't find papers appropriate for my talk, but obviously he was involved in all this as well. So I'm not leaving him out deliberately. It's just, um, it didn't fit nicely into this talk, but he wrote a nice article on the gamma contract in the Encyclopedia of Quantitative Finance, if you want to take a look. Anyway, the static options hedge is the spanning strip for 2s log s. And s log s is known as the entropy contract, because from physics, we know this is the expression for entropy. So it's the same story all over again. Now, I remember 
when I was teaching at NYU, and I can't remember what year that was. As I said before, Peter Carr is always there. So he was at the back of my lecture. And when I uh, projected up this formula, he said, where did you get that from? So he was absolutely fascinated by this formula here, namely that you, you can, amazingly, kind of amazing, uh, that you can express the uh, integrated variance, the expectation of integrated variance, or variance, variance contract, as I call it, as an integral over Black-Scholes implied vols, right? So it's just the integral of Black-Scholes implied vols with respect to Gaussian kernel. And, well, an interesting thing about this formula also is immediately imagine doing like, um, what do you call that? WKB or whatever you really call it. So just doing maximum likelihood on this thing and ask yourself, okay, where does this distribution peak? This distri distribution peaks at Z equals zero. And Z in this case is equal to D minus. So uh, the first order approximation for this story would be that the fair value of the variance contract is given by vol implied vol evaluated at D minus. And we know actually this is not that terrible, not very good, but not a terrible approximation for the value of the variance swap. You can do the same thing for the gamma swap, and you get exactly the same formula, except G minus repl is replaced by G plus. So again, you can do the same thing and say, okay, what's the first approximation to the value of the gamma contract? It's given by the Black-Scholes implied vol squared evaluated at D plus, which is obviously on the other side of zero. So in particular, if we have a parameterization of the volatility smile, such as SVI, computing the fair value of the covariance contract is straightforward. Uh, what do I mean by covariance contract? I mean the leverage contract, which is gamma minus variance. And why is that obvious? Well, because gamma is giving you the expectation of the product of the stock, the spot and the log spot, and variance is giving you the log spot the expectation of S over F on its own is just one. So you can see that by taking the difference, you're getting the, the value of the, the fair value of covariance of these two things. So in particular, if there's no covariance of, of variance and spot, the, variance, the gamma contract is equal to the variance contract. So we can always, already do lots of things here. Now, there's another paper that I only discovered recently. It was pointed out to me by a guy called Misha Fomitsky at Vola Dynamics, and he got interested in optimal portfolios, optimal option portfolios. So I wasn't aware of this paper, but I learned a lot by studying it. So let me go briefly through the argument. Uh, considering, consider investing some initial wealth in a derivative plane claim. So what's the value of my portfolio is going to be the uh, expectation under Q, which is the pricing measure of F. And expected utility is given by the integral with respect to utility of, uh, uh, with respect to the pricing, uh, the physical measure. Now find the F that maximizes U, okay? so. We write down the Lagrangian. So it's constrained maximization. And then the first order condition, it's easy to see from here, is just that a lambda should be rho p over rho q u prime. So basically, uh, lambda is given by uh, the marginal utility. And so integrating with respect to s, integrate that with respect to s, you get lambda because it's a density, integrate that. So there we get. So then solving this thing for F gives you a closed form formula for the optimal option portfolio uh, as a function of your preferences, your utility function. 
That's kind of cute. Okay. Now, let's suppose we know our utility function. So now we're taking we, everything so far was model free and beautiful. Uh, but now we're going to maximally restrict our preferences. We're going to say we know we are log investors. So I'm going to quote Marco Veianeda at this point. It's a sentence I love. It's a, well, a proverb that I love that he told me. Se non è vero, è ben trovato, which means if it's not true, it's a good story. So let me now tell a good story, a cute story, which of course may not be true. Now suppose that our representative investor I maximizes log W. In other words, we are Kelly investors. Since we're maximized, since U is log W, this is easy to calculate. U prime is just one over W. And we get that one over F is lambda times the ratio of the densities. So rearranging and integrating gives us this thing. So the Kelly optimal derivative payoff is given by this formula here. So you can see that F, this Kelly optimal payoff, is given by the ratio of the physical density to the risk neutral density. So now, from now on, let S be S and P, which we're going to say is the growth optimal portfolio. In equilibrium, the market portfolio is optimal for the representative investor I. So we get that dP by dQ is just S capital T over ST. It's the simplest imaginable change of measure. This portfolio is called the Long Numeraire portfolio, which named after a guy called Long, whose name I first encountered reading this paper, or the growth optimal portfolio. You find it all over benchmark option pricing and so on and so forth. So the change of measure is just the stock price. It's a Q martingale since S is a martingale under Q. The same result follows from the argument originally due to Mark Davis that in equilibrium market option prices should be such that the utility of an optimal stock portfolio cannot be increased by trading options. So, you know, it was kind of confusing to me this story before, but now we see it. Everything is pointing in the same direction. You cannot change the utility by trading options, tells you the optimal Options portfolio is just the forward contract. So now what about the drift? What about the equity premium? Well, the dynamics of the stock price under P are this. We don't know what mu is yet. What proportional pi, what proportion pi of wealth W should be held in stock? Well, we have this for the change in wealth. Applying Ito's formula, we get that. Now let's maximize that with respect to this weight pi. Well, we found that pi is optimal. So we just maximizing this here, just taking the derivative with respect to pi. We see that utility is maximized if pi, the weight held in stock is equal to mu over V. Now we found that pi is optimal, pi equal one is optimal, so we must have mu t is equal to vt. So this means in this simple model of the world, that the equity risk premium, the extra return that investors require for taking on risk is equal to instantaneous variance. And there are many, many different ways of looking at things that end up with the same result. I'm not saying this result is true, but it's a good story. It's such a good story that there are many ways of deriving the same thing. So assuming the volatility of S&P is 15%, let's say we get an equity risk premium of around two and a quarter per annum. And this seems like not, not unreasonable. So in this simple framework, we know the change of measure dP by dQ is just S capital T over S little t. So we can get the P distribution knowing the Q distribution. Well, that's very reminiscent of Ross recovery which Peter Carr was very, very interested in. In this case, we are fixing preferences. So it's not like we can recover without stating our preferences. That was the essence of Ross recovery. But um, Peter Carr and, uh, uh, wrote a brilliant paper on, on this topic, which I'm not going to talk about, but you can look and see what he wrote here. And in that paper, 
they have exactly the same um, story going on where basically equity risk premium is given by instantaneous variance. Now let's just focus on the variance risk premium, which was the topic of lots of work that he did with uh, Yuran Wu. Um, and here's the paper, variance risk, I think it's the top cited paper, one of his top cited papers. We propose a direct and robust method for quantifying the variance risk premium. Well, we know what he's going to do. He's going to apply the spanning formula and he's going to calculate the value of the log contract. So why do we trade variance? Well, banks buy variance to hedge short Vega risk or equivalently, they trade VIX, options or futures. Hedge funds sell variance to capture the variance risk premium. Uh, so basically, volatility arbitrage, which is what they call this, is not arbitrage at all, as we will soon see. It's just selling volatility. Selling volatility, as every neophyte trader knows, is a brilliant trade. For maybe one or two or three months, you sell out the money options and you delta hedge them. And every day, you're up money. And then once in a while, you lose everything and more. But that was okay. That was an act of God. So... That's fine. So this is the way volatility arbitrage goes. So in a, their top cited paper, they studied the variance premium, the amount that the short variance trade is expected to make. Uh, now, a, we started trading variance swaps, I think 1997, and then trading of these things really took off in 1998. Why? Well, because implied vols went sky high, ridiculously high. I seem to remember S&P five-year implied vol was 42. FTSE five-year implied vol was 44. And of course, uh, realized variance had never ever uh, reached that level, uh, nor did it ever reach that level since. So it's a great opportunity to sell volatility. What's the best way to sell volatility? The best way to sell volatility is variance swaps. Why is it the best way to sell volatility? Because you don't do anything. You just sell, no delta hedging, no nothing. You just sell, come back a year later in this particular case with up 15 volt points. I remember uh, we had a brilliant, uh, we had a brilliant variance swap trader whose name is uh, Duan Mu. And I think he knew Peter Carr very well from Cornell. They were both at Cornell. I'm not sure exactly what the relationship was. Maybe, maybe um, uh, Peter taught him in the, in the master's course or something like this. But I remember he had to visit a client. He was taken by the sales guys to visit a client. It was the last time because the sales guys were shocked. So he went to visit the client uh, first thing in the morning. And his, uh, Duan Mu's question to the client was, uh, do you guys like golf? So they're looking a little surprised by the question. Say, so, sure, we like golf. So, well, this is the perfect pro product for you because you just sell vol, go play golf and come back. And of course, he was absolutely right. They, they made a fortune and they didn't have to do anything. You don't even need a spreadsheet to book this. You can just book it on a piece of paper. So anyway, that's why people trade variance swaps. There's no work. It's not like selling a straddle, which involves delta hedging and stuff. Uh, this is really easy. So now, what's the definition of the variance risk premium? The definition of the variance premium, according to Karen Wu, is just the amount you get for selling the variance swap minus the amount you have to pay, which is expectation under the physical measure. Well, what is this thing? Well, this thing turns out to be, with that change of measure, expectation under the physical measure. Remember our change of measure? It's S times V. This is just the gamma contract. So this is the variance, the variance contract minus the gamma contract. So a, it's the leverage contract. So the leverage contract basically gives us a precise measure of the variance risk premium under log utility. 
both all of these components are model free prices in terms of log and entropy contracts. So what is the empirical variance risk premium? Let's look at it. Well, you know, this is exactly the story I just told. Here's the uh, realized variance. So in other words, imagining that you sold a 30 day variance contract every day. What would your PL look like? Well, you can kind of see that it's above zero most of the time. So it's exactly as I explained, every day, every day, every day, you're showing your manager you're making money, except from time to time, you lose a fortune. Here's a graph of the equity account. So you see at the beginning here, but here, whoa, you went a long period of time, like four, four years, making money every day, every day, every day, basically. And then boom, you get fired. And then you start all over again. <laughs> so a hedge fund is a great business. And then, you know, boom, again. But, you know, you get fired, you start again. So it, these, this figure clearly shows that the short variance trade is profitable on average, but with absolutely massive drawdowns. Uh, so here, here's a statistic. Our average PL would have been $454 a day, plus or minus $5,200. So it doesn't even capture the huge tails. The equivalent average risk premium, according to our formula, is given by minus the leverage swap, $228. Well, they're kind of similar numbers, right? And everything depends on the path. Unfortunately, we only have one life. If I'd shown you a different life that chopped up here, the, prop the profitability of this trade would have been much higher. And for all we know, there's going to be another crash on Monday, and then the profitability would have been much lower. So it's impossible to say really. So now let's repeat the regressions that Karen Wu did. They estimated the following relations. Realized variance is equal to A plus B times V. And, uh, Right, and log RV is A plus B times log V. It should be log V, not log RV. And what did I find when I did these regressions? I found that RV has like, is basically equal to V, where V is the variance contract, and log RV goes to log V, where log V is the variance contract. So uh, basically what this says is that uh, the VIX or equivalent VIX squared, the log strip, is a great um, forecast of realized variance. Yeah, and here's a picture that should convince you. So this is kind of a backdoor justification of the kind of thing that Julien was trying to do yesterday with this model. Basically, if you can predict, you, you can't really show that you can predict realized variance. Realized variance is all over the place. According to me, it's rough which means it goes kind of crazy. But you can see just from the picture that VIX squared is an incredibly good predictor of realized variance. The shape is exactly the same. Now, what's the time series of the leverage contract? Since I said the leverage contract is risk premium in the simple model of the world. In other words, what can we do with this story? Well, the answer is I don't know. But let's just, so we see the risk premium that you get for selling the various contract can sometimes be huge. So it kind of, kind of tempting to say, well, when the risk premium gets very high, just sell the variance swap. Let's see what happens if you do that. We probably can predict spikes, but we can measure leverage. So why not sell variance only after a spike in leverage? So for example, suppose we only sell variance on days when the leverage contract breaches points 0.0015. So I'm saying whenever it reaches this level, just sell the variance contract. Seems reasonable. What happens to you? Well, unfortunately, you can escape the drawdowns, right? Because when you sell here, unfortunately, you sold expensive, but it got more expensive, right? So that's the problem. So it seems like there's no way, markets are efficient, there's no way of just making money like this. You've got to take risk. So what's the summary of this story? 
Using the Karmadan spanning formula, we computed various model-free quantities, including the variance contract and the gamma contract. Under log utility, the optimal portfolio is the market portfolio, which we just take to be S&P. That's a common assumption. The change of measure is incredibly simple. The equity risk premium is just instantaneous variance. And then the variance risk premium is given by the leverage swap. Everything computable from option prices. So what's my final conclusion? I think, and I think you see how this relates to the small co uh, corner of Peter Carr's work. Be curious. He, he was interested in everything with an encyclopedic knowledge of the literature. He's interested in everything from variants that we talked about today to applications of quantum mechanics to financial markets. Look for beauty. You see the, the kind of things he came up with are all kind of beautiful in their own right. Work very hard. I don't know anybody who worked harder than him. In fact, his capacity for uh, hard work was unbelievable. Be like Peter Carr. Thanks a lot. Well, wow, what a what a trip uh, along the intersection of your interests in volatility and Peter Carr's uh, interest in volatility. There was um, a very important technical question raised by the speaker that I want to come back to for the record. Uh, does anyone in the audience know for a fact if Peter Carr advised the CBOE? Do we have any information? I'll take that as he didn't, someone would have known. Any questions from the audience? I think we have a few online to come back to as well. Uh, you mentioned quickly that the gamma contract is uh, interesting for traders uh, dealing with dispersion. Uh, could you expand on that a bit? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to send you straight to the article by Roger Lee in Imply Encyclopedia of Quantitative Finance. And basically, he shows that it's the right, it, it changes, it captures the change in weight of a particular stock in the index. And that's why multiplying by S turns out to be a good idea. There are a few questions online. Ah, okay. uh, what is VIX in a pure jump model? Perhaps the square root of quadratic variation generated by jumps? Good information. She's answering the question. Yep. She says it was Goldman Sachs. Uh, can we go up so we see? Who proposed VIX futures because they wanted to hedge their credit exposure? Credit exposure? Okay, yeah. obviously sufficient to assume heterogeneous expectations to get a role for options. In fact, with exponential utility, trade stock based on drift. I don't know. What is VIX in a pure jump model? Okay, well, that's an, that's an interesting question. For the answer to that question, you should go to my book, The Volatility Surface. And in fact, you will see that this uh, formula, this VIX strip, is a very good formula, even in the presence of jumps, so long as the jumps are not too big. So what do we mean by not too big? We mean something of the order of less than 5% between resets. So if you're resetting your uh, variance swap daily, anything less than 5% per, you know, between resets is fine. Uh, so, Again, we don't know what the true process is. We can argue whether there are or are not jumps, but the, the log strip is a, is a good formula. And a comment by Heliet at the bottom. Very beautiful talk, uh, Jim. And thank you indeed. If there are no more questions from the audience, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Christos. <laughs>